this church once again this Lord's Day. Sorry, job down some notes there. Sorry about that. Memory's good, it's just really short. Uh, just a couple of uh, announcements uh, this morning. Uh, a reminder of the hymn sing and fellowship this evening at the home of Pats of Art uh, at 5.30 p.m. Also, uh, if you uh, grab a copy of your bulletin, there's many more things you're going to look at. Also, uh, another thing that just got brought up was uh, Don had us know that Holly is being induced today. Oh. So, uh, another, another name will be added to the Shuttleworth family uh, very shortly, we pray. And also, next Sunday, we're going to be having our fellowship lunch. So, if you're, uh, there's a list on the table there, you can have a look at it and jot something down. So, that's the announcements. If you now turn, take your Bibles and turn with me together, Psalm 67 for our call to worship. Psalm 67. This psalm was telling us that joy comes from spreading the news about God around the world, which is what every Christian is going to do. Obviously, we know of the Great Commission. Jesus called us to go over among the world and baptize them. So psalm 67 says, God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Let your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God. Our God blesses us. God blesses us. That all the ends of the earth may fear you. <laughs> Let's put together the prayer that we know again. Our Father, we do thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this word that we just read. Father, we know that we are commanded, not a suggestion, but we are commanded to go and preach the gospel to all those around the world. Father, we do pray that you would help us in this endeavor, that you would give us the courage to do so, that we would fear God and not fear man, that we would preach your word, that we would witness to the lost. <coughs> we thank you, Father, for your word. It's amazing to us, Father, to think that we can hold a copy of God's word in our hands, and that we can have access to it at any time of the day or night that we wish. Father, we know that we fall so horribly short in this simplest of things. We pick up your word and read. So help us, Father, not only this morning as we sing hymns and we hear the preaching of your word, but Father, when we leave this place, may we have an increased appreciation for your word, have a desire and absolutely be consumed with reading your word. Father, again, we are needy people and you've given us reading your word on our own will profit us nothing unless your Holy Spirit is with us, ministering to us, tutoring us. And we pray for that very thing this morning. That you would be with us, that your spirit would be poured out upon your people, on our pastor as he preaches. Father, please be with us this morning. Give us what we need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your blue hymnals. We'll turn to hymn number 12. Exalt the Lord with what we are here to do. Let's stand together and sing. Psalm 135. Praise ye the Lord, O ye servants of the Lord.
Come to the second letter from Paul to the Corinthian church. In our consecutive reading through the New Testament. In this first chapter, the apostle begins in the exact same fashion, almost verbatim, as he did in the first letter. In the opening verse, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. From verses 3 to 6, Paul describes God's goodness to him and his fellow workers throughout various trials. And as God's people, we can be assured that trials will come and tribulations will come, but we'll, we need to consider before we grumble the purpose of those trials and tribulations, as did Paul. The purpose of those trials and tribulations is to refine us as in the fire. The goal of tribulations that God sent our way is to drive us to Him, drive us to our knees. And only when we are having that mindset can we be thankful for those trials as Paul was. Think of other places, the apostles and Paul, even when we'd be chained together in a dungeon, locked in jail, singing praises to God for their privilege to suffer. How many of us have that, that mindset? I know I certainly don't. But we may pray and ask God that He would give us that mindset. And trials and tribulations do come, and they will. As many in here already know, many dark trials. Remember that they are for our benefit. They are designed to draw us closer to God. So let's read together the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. God's word says this. Paul, an apostle of Christ. Sorry, let me start that again. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. But we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You also joining in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf, for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. But we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, and I hope you will understand until the end. Just as, you, just as you also probably did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. In this confidence I intended at first to come to you, so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is, to pass your way into Macedonia, and again from Macedonia to come to you, and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? For what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, so that with me there will be yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who, has, who was preached among you by us, by me, Manus, <coughs> and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. 
For as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yet. Therefore also through him is our Amen, the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. But I call God as witness to my soul, that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but are workers with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. I pray that God will add his blessing to the reading and the preaching of the word this morning. As we go to prayer once again, we'll be remembering our friends in the Far East and giving thanks for the safe return of the workers uh, from refugees and uh, that the warfare is not as close as it once perhaps was. We'll be remembering the Cook family as the mourning the loss of Al's brother Doug and the uns uh, many unsaved members in that family. Praying that God will use this for good, as we know He will. And we'll also, as I already said, be remembering Holly and uh, Stephen today, but especially Holly. Uh, and then, uh, of course, praying for ourselves once again. So let's look to the Lord. Father, it's already been a blessing this morning for us to be here in your house, to be singing your praises, to be reading your word. Father, would you know that we are a forgetful people, we are a people whose mind wanders from here to there. Even though uh, we, be, we may be singing words, uh, keeping rhythm to the tune, our minds could be far off and certainly our hearts with you. Father, we pray that as we continue to sing, Later, as Pastor John comes, our minds will be focused, our minds will be held captive to your word and to what we are hearing, that it might be beneficial to our souls. Father, we would remember our friends in the Far East, who already talked about this morning, trials and tribulations. Father, we can't even imagine what it would be like to be in that situation, having so many hundreds of children, refugees, having to be responsible for their care. Not only their physical care, but their spiritual care. Father, we pray that you would continue to protect them from the war that rages on in that country. We thank you that many have returned to the, to the uh, place there. Father, we do continue to pray that you would be with them, give them grace to endure, give them patience. And Father, give them strength to hold up under this burden and under these trials. We also remember the Cook family, Father, and Doug's family, and Al's family, all the extended family members, Father, and large family. We do pray for Doug's wife as she mourns the passing of her husband, his children, his other family members, Father, that you would comfort them. But again, Father, we know that you are a good God and that you do all things well. We pray that you would use the passing of Doug and even the, the knowledge, the news that. Doug, at the last moment, had a deathbed confession of faith in Christ. And Father, we just thank you for that wonderful mercy. And Father, we pray that that would be a witness to the family, that they would see and wonder and be curious about these things. We know, Lord, there's been no shortage of gospel truth shared with that family. Thank you for Al, for Lord, for Ken, as they many, many times shared the gospel with them all. Father, we pray that it would have eternal benefit, not only for Doug, but for his family. Again, Lord, we would ask that you would bring out the Lord and Ken home safe and sound when this is all over. We would also remember Holly, Father, as you know, Lord, she's being in use today. We would pray for her. We would pray that all things would be smoothly for her. And for the baby, Lord, that the baby would come in good time, that she would not have to languish in the effect of the drugs and labor for long. And that, Father, most sincerely, Lord, we pray for the sins of Stephen and Holly, and of their children. Father, please, set your redeeming love upon them and save their souls. Even as Stephen and Holly seek to raise their children, Father, we pray that they would be do doing so in a Christian way. Again, Lord, we thank you for the witness that Don and Cheryl have been giving all their lives. We will pray, Father, again, that this would have eternal fruit. Father, please, we ask that you would be with us once again this hour. But not only this hour, Father, the rest of this day, we go our separate ways, and later as we reconvene at Pat's house, we'll be in our midst. But that time later at Pat's place will be a time of just tremendous blessing for us as your people, as we sing more hymns, and as we fellowship one with another. 
Father, pour out your blessings upon us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take your blue middle of once again. We'll turn to hymn number 366. Sing, O God of mercy. Certainly, truer words were never spoken even in light of what we've heard this morning. O God of mercy. Remain seated as we sing from Matthew 25 and verse 40. And as much as you have done it unto one of the one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Oh 
Again, just a reminder about our fellowship meal last uh, next week and the sign-up sheet on the table. We're normally having our fellowship meal on the second Sunday of the month, but I'm not going to be here. <laughs> and so it's not the food so much that I'm longing for, but the opportunity to be with you. And then next week also, Lord willing, we're going to have some uh, visitors from North Bay. Uh, we've had Doug and Shannon Webb here before. You now they've got a little boy. And they're still hoping in the future, Shannon's in some school right now, but that they would uh, uh, change location and move down here and uh, perhaps worship with us. So I thought it would be a good opportunity again for them uh, to be able to spend some time with you. So please remember that for next Sunday. Now if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. This is the third message I've prepared ultimately to bring to uh, the church in Australia on servants of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read the first 16 verses and then we'll pray together. <coughs> Ephesians 4 and verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And there is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captains and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now let's look to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that because of Christ, we can call you our Father, the God who has made all things, the God who continues to rule over all things, working out all things according to the counsel of your will, the God who works everything together for our good giving us a gospel, giving us a relationship with Christ that we can never be separated from. Oh, our Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, you see us here, we're seated before you, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear from your word. 
how we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit in abundance. We need your Holy Spirit, even as we were singing earlier, that he would read the word of God with us, as it were, that he would give us understanding, that he would convict our hearts where it is necessary, and that he would encourage us, and that he would help us to be those people that we need to be because of the gospel. Heavenly Father, come and do that work in our lives that will bring you ultimate glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> When this world wraps up and our lives are all done and all humanity is gathered before the Lord Jesus Christ on that awesome day of judgment, works of service are going to be a very important issue. Now, we've already seen that this matter of service on the day of judgment will be to the unmasking of some people. We consider those awesome words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 7, where people come up to him on the day of judgment and they're eager to confess him, Lord, Lord, and then they remind him of all the works of service that they have done in his name. And he speaks to them those awesome words. I never knew to part from me. So we know that our service can't get us into heaven. We must know Christ. We must have grace in our hearts. We must be those who are diligently following our Savior, both in private devotion and public devotion. But simply because this matter of service will be to the unmasking of some, it doesn't mean that service isn't important. For the Lord Jesus himself reminds us that service, works of service, is going to be one of the crucial issues in the judgment. Remember in Matthew 25, Jesus gives his disciples the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it's a parable about the judgment day. And he is going to gather all mankind before him. He's, he's the shepherd. He's going to place the sheep on his right hand. He's going to place the goats on his left hand. And we know from the parable that the sheep are his people. They're identified by him as the righteous. The goats are those who are not his people, the unrighteous. Listen to what Jesus says to the righteous. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen carefully. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. So as we consider this subject of Christian service, it's not simply a matter that the church needs more workers. It's not simply that the pastor needs help or the deacons could use some extra hands. That may all be true, 
But the issue ultimately is this identifying factor of true Christianity. When you stand before Christ on Judgment Day, will you come bringing works that show you love Jesus Christ, you ministered to Christ, you sacrificed for Christ by ministering to his people? I want to address this issue of service one more time by thinking especially of service to Christ within the church of the Lord Jesus. And I want us to focus especially on Paul's words here in Ephesians 4 and verse 12. <clears throat> to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the church. So in other words, God's people serving one another in the church of Christ. Now, perhaps you're familiar with the book of Ephesians, and you know that here in chapter 4, Paul begins the practical section of his letter. Paul often follows that pattern of laying down the doctrinal truth and then building the practical assertions on it. It doesn't mean that there's nothing practical in the doctrinal section and nothing doctrinal in the practical section, but generally that kind of um, schedule can be seen in Paul's letter. And we have it here. So chapters 1 to 3, Paul lays out the glorious doctrine of salvation, how God has rescued us from our sins through the gift of Jesus Christ. And now, as he begins into this practical section, his burden is this, that we who are the people of God, who claim to be Christians, that we would live lives that are consistent with this glorious salvation that the Lord Jesus has brought to us. And so he's going to address several areas of concern in terms of, okay, you've been saved in this incredible way, how is this to impact your life? And the first subject he takes up is the local church and how, as Christians, we're to live together in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He spells out various qualities that we need to have as God's people as we live together in the church. Things like loneliness. A willingness to think lowly of yourself as you come and fellowship with others and serve them. Patience and forbearance. In other words, there are going to be people in the church context that rub you the, long, or the wrong way. And you can't just say, that's it, I'm out of here. No, you've got to learn to live with them patiently and, and bearing with them. And then, of course, eagerness for unity. Eagerness that with one mind and one voice and one action, we would be serving Christ and bringing glory to God. He spells out even further that last point of being eager for unity. And in verses 4 to 6, he has this wonderful statement about what is to be the unity of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? United in our faith in God and spiritual experience. Being identified as one body, not merely many parts or many people, but one body joined together. The hope that we share together, that we're traveling to heaven together and we're looking forward to that time when we'll be together up in that heavenly place. So, a glorious picture of the church, and Paul says this is what we need to be working at as we work out our salvation. Now it's important that we stop here and ask a very important question. How is this unity that Paul is describing achieved? How does a local church become a living demonstration of these glorious 
statements that Paul makes here about the church. He doesn't leave us wondering. He answers the question very clearly. This is how a group of people saved by the Lord Jesus become this church, this glorious body that Paul has described. It's because the ascended Christ, Christ at the end of his redemptive work, having lived a perfect life, suffered and died on the cross, buried in the tomb, risen on the third day, and then 40 years later, ascended back to heaven. It's because the ascended Christ has given gifts to all of his people. And when those gifts that Christ has given to his people are being exercised in the local church in lowliness and patience and love, the church grows to be a living replica of Christ. Now that's why the Apostle's statement here in verse 12 is so important. Saints working at ministry is critical to the church becoming what God wants it to be, a mature reflection of the Savior. So that the world can look at the church, look at the gathered people of God and say, well, <clears throat> I've never met Christ, but I think that's what Christ is like. Well, as we begin to focus in on Paul's statement here in verse 12, let's consider, first of all, a necessary progression. A necessary progression. Now, as the Apostle sets before us this glorious picture of the church, he describes a progression of events which is necessary to bring such a result. In other words, there are steps that need to be followed to achieve this end, the end of a unified, mature, and stable congregation. So what's this necessary progression? What are the steps? The first step has already taken place. The ascended Christ distributing his gifts. So this progression began when our Lord Jesus returned to heaven, when he ascended to heaven at the end of his earthly ministry. Paul tells us that in that ascension, as he went up to the throne of God, he distributed gifts to his people. Now Paul gives us a striking picture of this event by quoting from Psalm 68 in verse 8. Look again at the quote. Verse 8, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now in Psalm 68, and I almost wish we had time to be able to go back there and study it because it's such a glorious psalm. David is describing the Ark of the Covenant coming into the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Now you remember, the Ark of the Covenant, it was basically a box covered with gold, with a beautiful lid on it, a lid of gold called the Mercy Seat. That Ark was the visible symbol of the presence of God among His people during Old Testament days. So as that box was carried into the city by the priests and placed in the sanctuary, it was meant to say to the people, God is here in our midst. God has come among us. God has come into Jerusalem at the head of his armies, the conquering hero who has ascended his throne. This is God marching on in triumph. If we could go back into Psalm 68, David gathers together into a single picture a whole bunch of Israel's history. And it shows God taking his people out of Egypt, bringing them through the wilderness, bringing them into Canaan, conquering the land, establishing his people there, and finally coming up to Jerusalem as its capital. It's God marching in triumph 
at the head of his people. Now behind him, there's a host of men that he had captured in his military exploits. And he was laden down with the spoils of war. And so from that treasure trove, he distributed gifts to his people. Now the Apostle Paul, in quoting Psalm 68, has taken this Old Testament picture and showed how it was fulfilled in the ascension of our Lord Jesus to heaven. His ascension was far more than a simple transport of a lonely figure from earth to heaven. If all we knew about the ascension of Christ was what we read at the end of the Gospel accounts, we would think of the Lord Jesus gathered with his disciples, he's teaching them, he's exhorting them, he's encouraging them, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, there he goes up to the clouds in heaven. It looks like the transport of a single individual up to heaven. But it was far more than that, as Paul tells us here, using this illustration from Psalm 68. This was Christ returning to the heavenly throne room as the conquering hero. He had descended into this world, into these lonely lower regions, in a mind-blowing humiliation that took him as low as death on a cross. He had entered into conflict with all the forces of hell. And while he hung on that cross, looking like a helpless victim, he triumphed over them, putting them all to shame. But now he was entering into heaven again to be received as the beloved of his Father who had accomplished all the Father's plan for our salvation. In procession behind him was a great host of captains. It's hard to know whether the picture Paul is giving us here is describing the enemies of God's kingdom that would be cast into hell, or the host of the redeemed who had been rescued from Satan's dominion and would become part of God's kingdom. In his possession were the spoils of war, great honors heaped upon him by his father, and from this extravagant gift he now possessed, he gave gifts to men. And these gifts can be identified as the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon his church at Pentecost, and the individual gifts that he has given to all of his people for ministry in the local church. Now that's the first part of the progression. The first step to a mature serving congregation. It's the ascended Christ and his generous gifts given to his people. Now what's the second step in the progression? Well, the second step is this, the ministry of the Word of God in the church. As Paul continues to describe this progression that takes a church to maturity in Christ, he spells out the first group of gifts that he gives to his church. Look at verse 11. He's just described his ascension, his giving of gifts. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors, because that's what pastor means, the shepherds and teachers. So here Christ ascending into glory and he's giving these gifts to the church and the first set of gifts are men to minister the Word of God to the church. We know who the apostles were. That first group of men chosen by the Lord Jesus to be with him during the days of his earthly ministry, to witness his resurrection out of the tomb, and then in his physical absence, to go out into the world and preach the gospel throughout all creation. They were particularly charged by Christ to take the truths that he had taught them and give those things to the church. 
And many, of course, of them were led by the Spirit of God to write the Word of God down, and we have their letters and books in the New Testament. So the apostles, then the prophets, these were men in the early days of the church, during the apostolic age, who were gifted by God to communicate the truth of God to his people in those days when they didn't have a completed Bible. Well, you couldn't gather together on a Sunday morning and the pastor say, you know, turn to 2 Corinthians 1, like Mike did with us this morning. They didn't have those. Many of the books weren't written yet. And so God gave gifts to men to be prophets and to proclaim in his church his truth until that time of a completed Bible. Then there are the evangelists. We're not exactly sure who Paul is referring to here. Possibly this might refer to men like Timothy and Titus, men who were the helpers of the apostles, sent by the apostle Paul to various places, various congregations, to deliver the word of God given to them by the apostles. So we know that they were working in the first century does that office continue down to our day? Could these evangelists perhaps be something like the missionaries of our day who go to places where Christ has not been heard of and declare the word of God? It's hard to be dogmatic about that. But then this last category, two terms, that because of the grammar we believe belong together. Shepherds, pastors, and teachers. Perhaps we should even call them pastor teachers. And we know from the New Testament that these are men that God has called to labor in the churches until Jesus returns. And their primary task as shepherds is to teach, to feed God's people with the truths of his word. So Christ is ascended. He's giving gifts, this first category, men to minister in his churches. And the common element between all of them is that their ministry is to bring the word of God to God's people. This is the gift of the ascended Christ to his church. Of all the blessings that our conquering hero has given to us, he's provided for his church men who are able to take the scriptures and bring them to our minds and hearts. Now, according to Paul's description here, that's the second step on this path to maturity. This is how a group of Christians gets to the place of being a well-functioning body in Christ by embracing this gift of Christ in the ministry of the Word of God. Now the third step in the progression as Paul has described it here, the serving of all of the saints one to another. As our triumphant leader distributes his gifts, they don't fall on just a few. It's not just, well, apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, they got some gifts for work of ministry. <coughs> No, as he distributes his gifts, they don't fall on just a few. Christ has gifts for all of his people. Everyone who is a true Christian receives a gift from Christ. And as that gift is given and exercised, the church is built up. It grows into this unified body. It becomes a mature, loving, stable congregation that brings glory to God. Now, as we examine this progression and think about this third step, a body of believers growing into a church that is a well-functioning body, there's a double work taking place in the saints preparing them for this work. First of all, the truth we've already considered, Christ gives gifts to all of his people. Look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us 
according to the measure of Christ's gift. So Paul doesn't say this is just for me as an apostle or whoever is a prophet in your church or the pastor or evangelist. Christ has given a gift to every one of us according to his grace. Now what's the measure of his grace? Well, it's his heavenly treasure trove. <laughs> it's his unlimited resources. And out of that, he gives to his people gifts so that we can serve in his church. But there's a second way in which believers are prepared for this work of service. It's what he delineates here in verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Of course, in verse 11, he's talked about the public ministry of the word, and that public ministry of the word, as it goes out Lord's Day by Lord's Day, is meant to equip God's people for works of service. This word, equip, that is translated here, translates a, a word from the Greek that isn't used a lot throughout the New Testament. But when it is used, it's, it's very interesting. For instance, go back to the early sections of the gospel when Jesus calls James and John, remember they were fishermen, he found them repairing their nets. That word, repairing their nets, is the word that Paul uses here to equip. So the nets have been torn. They're not going to be effective in their task. They could throw them out in the water and pull them in and all the fish would slip through. So they need to be repaired. The word is also used in the realm of medicine to describe the repair of broken bones or of putting dislocated limbs back together. Now certainly that speaks well to our lives as Christians. It's a good picture of what we are as Christians saved by grace. Spiritually, as we continue in this life, we are still full of rips and tears, broken bones, dislocated joints. That's what we are like spiritually. And the Word of God preached to us repairs us. As we listen to it, and long for God to work in our hearts as a result of it and embrace its directives. Paul says it equips us and it prepares us for useful service. The phrase translated here, equipped for the work of ministry, the work of ministry or the work of service, that phrase is perhaps too general, general. If we translate it literally, it would be for the work of deaconing. For the work of deaconing. Now that doesn't mean that we're all going to be deacons. The word is being used by Paul in a general sense, as it often is in the New Testament. <coughs> Remember that the deacon was a table servant, taking up a lowly task and waiting on others. And Paul is reminding us that as we're being equipped by Christ through his gift and the ministry of his word for works of service, we are to be deacons in this general sense of the term. We're to take up this gift of Christ and we're to work, serve one another in a very lowly way. So here's the progression that Paul sets before us in this passage. How a group of God's people, saved by this incredible grace of God described in the first three chapters, becomes a strong, unified church. It's the ascended Christ, triumphant after his redemption, and he's giving gifts to his people. That's been done. It's the gifts of Christ, of ministry, bringing God's word to the church. That is happening in an ongoing way. And then it's the people of God serving one another in love, patience, and forbearance. That's our present challenge. And Paul shows us 
that this progression will develop a church into a body of people that looks like Christ. Well, let's go on secondly to consider some important challenges. We've looked at this progression leading up to verse 12, the saints being equipped, serving one another like lowly servants, and ultimately becoming a, a body reflecting Christ. Now what are the challenges that come to us as we consider Paul's words here? Well, I want to ask you a very simple question. This is the first challenge. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this progression that Paul sets before us will produce a strong, healthy church that looks like Christ. Let's think about the steps. Do you believe in the ascension of Christ and his distribution of gifts? Because surely, surely, every Christian must say, absolutely, I believe that. As much as I believe that Jesus came into this world and lived a perfect life in obedience to his Father, as much as I believe that Jesus suffered and died and he went to the cross and shed his blood in my place, as much as I believe that he was buried in that tomb, that he was really dead, as much as I believe that he came out of that tomb by the power of God on the third day, I believe that the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven to be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. I believe he entered into heaven as a conquering hero, and I believe he distributed his gifts to the church. I believe that. That's part of the cornerstone of my faith. I trust that every Christian here this morning can say, either audibly or in their hearts at least, a hearty amen. That is what I believe. But then second, do you believe that Christ has given the ministry of the word to equip us? Do you believe that Christ has given the ministry of the word to equip us? Well, you're here. And as you're here week by week, you know that the great central focus of our church is this very thing, the proclamation of God's truth. We don't spend our time doing all kinds of other things. We give ourselves to worship God and to praise God, but then our focus and the great priority of our time is the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, the communication of what God has given to us in the Bible. So I know you're here and you're, you're listening. You're obviously part of a church that places a premium on the ministry of the Word of God. But how are you receiving? Because that's, that's part of the expression of faith in Christ's gift. How are you receiving? Are you receiving it as the Word of God? Do you look at this and say, boy, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That was Paul, but ultimately that's God speaking to me. Do you take this as the Word of God coming to your heart? And do you receive it? As James reminds us, we need to receive it meekly. When we come to and receive the word of God meekly, we're saying, okay, God, I'm one of those persons with rips and tears. I'm one of those persons, there's, there's problems with me. There's still sin in my heart. I know that the Word of God is showing me time and time again all of the things I'm failing to do. So Lord, speak to me and convict me and help me to know where I need to be mended, where my broken spiritual bones need to be healed. 
where my dislocated spiritual joints need to be put back together. Lord, cause your word to repair me. Cause your word to deal with me. Are you asking the question, how is God's word going to put me back together to make me a profitable servant of Christ? That all under the heading of this question, do you believe that Christ has given the ministry of the word to equip us? And then thirdly, do you believe that Christ has gifted you to serve your brothers and sisters. You see Christ going up to heaven. You see him in ascended glory. You sing hymns like crown him with many crowns. You rejoice in the exaltation of Christ. Well, do you believe that as a result of that exaltation, Christ has given you a gift. Now, it's not just this passage that speaks about that. We could go through the New Testament. Paul speaks of it again and again. In many places, the gifts given to the church, the gifts given to the people of God. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul shows us that the sovereign spirit has given gifts to all of his people. All different. We're not all the same, possessing all the same gifts, but we've all got a gift that Christ has given to us to minister to one another. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that this ascended, glorious Christ has given you a gift? And it's not just a gift like that parable of the talents that Jesus took uh, told where you take the talent and you think, well, this is beautiful. I'm going to put it in a, in a, a handkerchief and bury it in the dirt. No, that Christ has given you a gift in order to be a servant to all of his people. How is this faith in Christ and his gift giving turning into action in your life? So that's the first challenge. Do you believe these things? Second, are there objections that rise up in your mind when you are challenged to serve? Are there objections that rise up in your mind when you are challenged to serve? We always need to remember sin operating in our lives is a great rationalizer. Sin comes up with the greatest excuses. And sin will persuade you of a host of reasons why you can regularly and faithfully serve your brethren. I'm too busy. I'm battling a health crisis. I've served for many years in somebody else's turn. It's a hard time in family life right now. That keeps me from serving. I'm not gifted. And the list could go on and on. The bottom line is always this. If you wait for what looks like the perfect season in life to serve Christ in the church, it will never happen. It will never happen. Because when you're young and you're a teenager, you're busy with many, many things. And then you enter into married life and you have children and things are very busy, you're getting established in your work career, and you're working with your children, and you're busy there, and there are things to do with them, and then you get into the middle stage of life. Kathy and I always have said along, there's going to become a point where we're less busy, 
We're busier now than we've ever been. And if you allow those excuses to keep you from serving your brethren in the church, if you ever came to the opportune time, another excuse would just replace the last excuse. We must remember that on the day of judgment, Christ will say to people, you did these things to me, or you didn't do these things to me. No excuses are accepted. No one is going to come forward and say, well, I would have visited you when you were sick, but my, my, my job, or my family, or... No, you visited me when I was sick, or you didn't visit me when I was sick. You either did it or you didn't. So I want to ask you, when you are challenged about this area of serving Christ in the church, are there objections that rise up in your mind and would keep you from saying, yep, that's me, and the Word of God is meant to equip me so that I will take up lowly service to my brothers and sisters in the church. Thirdly and finally, in terms of things that we need to think about and challenges to us, areas of service, practical areas, practical ideas where we could serve one another. If you're looking for ideas, one of the best places to start is the list that Jesus gave in Matthew 25. In that parable where he's got the people in front of him for judgment, and he said, these were the things you did, these were the things you didn't do. Obviously, those are things that Christ wants us to do. He says, you gave me food and drink. Here were people who opened up their home for hospitality. You welcomed me as a stranger. You clothed me because I was in need. You visited me when I was sick. You came to me when I was in prison. And I think the idea is that here people are being visited because they were in prison suffering for the sake of Christ, like many in the first century would. What a great list to look at and say, have I done any of these things? Have I done any of these things for the Lord Jesus? Could the Lord Jesus say, as you did it to one of my brothers or sisters, you did it to me? <clears throat> well, the list he gives us in Matthew 25 is fairly general, referring to a Christian living in the world. But there are many needs within the Church of Christ specifically. There's always the need for officers. Always the need for officers. Always the need for people who are, for men who are willing to say, I will serve in an office. Now we know that that just can't happen easily like that. There are special standards that must be met, but it always has to begin with a willingness to take up the work. And if there's not a willingness, if there's not someone, a man, saying, well, God has equipped me through the Word, I'm willing to serve, there aren't going to be any church officers. There's always need for more Sunday school teachers. We talked together uh, in the men's fellowship about maybe coming up with some reels that we could put on Facebook, little video clips from sermons that would be used to advertise our church on social media. Other churches like ours have done that, and it's been a means of bringing people in from the outside. But it's going to take time. Who's willing to sit down and go through a 40 or 45 minute sermon and say, I think that 30 second clip would make a good reel. And then all of the work that would be involved 
in putting that onto the internet and being used. We're thinking about distributing an invitation through the neighborhood um, in September. <coughs> Who's willing to organize that and, and, and bring that forward? What about all of those practical works that are essentially spiritual? Praying for each other on a regular basis. Taking the church directory, Jen has put a great one online, and going family through family like we do on Wednesday night, and praying for all of God's people. What about seeking to be aware of needs that are in the congregation? whether those needs are physical or spiritual, sometimes both, and making sure, okay, I know this person is going through some suffering. This Lord's Day, I'm going to go and speak a word of encouragement, or maybe I'm going to send a note to them or an email, just tell them I'm praying for them and seek to build them up. What about speaking the truth in love that Paul talks about here in this passage? encouraging one another through the message of the Bible that will be loving and strengthening. It's not just the pastor who's supposed to take the Bible and share it with people in the congregation. You're supposed to do that with one another. And it may be as simple as, hey, I was reading this past week in my Bible and I read this passage and I thought about you. Can I share it with you? When your heart is burdened by God's word and you're looking and you're thinking, well, what can I do? You can always come to the pastor. You can always come to our deacon and say, listen, what jobs need to be done? What, what could I do to help? There's always a plan. Brethren, it's a reminder that Christianity is not intended by our Christ to be a spectator's form. We're not to be sitting in the bleachers watching the people on the field. Those are the gifted people, so we'll just sit and watch. Christ has gifted us all. We're all on the playing field, the church, and we're meant to serve one another using these gifts that Christ has given to us. If Christ has brought you into this church, he has a work for you to do. And he's gifted you, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the whole body. So that as Paul says at the end of this passage, that will be like a well-oiled machine, all the parts working together and being built up to look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Our works are intended to show the glory of Christ's redemptive work. As Paul has said earlier in the letter, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the living out of our salvation, the living out of this glorious work that Christ has brought us in the gospel. Dear people, on the day of judgment, what will identify you? Things that you have done to your brothers and sisters in Christ and therefore done to Christ. May we long for that commendation at the end of the examination. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It's found in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Thank you for the plainness of your word. Thank you for this description of how a group of God's people can become a mature, stable church looking like Christ. 
Oh, Father, may that be our longing more and more to know your work in us. We would worship the Lord Jesus. We thank you that we have such a glorious King. Thank you for the gifts that he's dis distributed among us. May we not despise these gifts, but take them up joyfully, knowing that Christ has called us to service. Or, oh, Father, there is much work to be done in all of our hearts. You know that. Father, you know there's much work to be done in my heart. Will you not, our God, by your Spirit, use your word for its intended purpose? And ultimately, may you receive all of the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.